everyone, welcome to part six of my Books for Art Inspiration series, which is a deep dive into books from my personal collection that I think you'll find inspiring and interesting. So for this video today, I have three books that are quite different, but are all connected by this sort of beautiful and inspiring aesthetic that I really enjoy and I think you will too. First up, we have this sweet little book all about the life and work of Eric Revilius. And next is a children's book about the Cottingley Fairies by Anna Sender. It's based on a true story. And lastly, we have this huge, huge book. It's quite heavy. Um, all about the films of the director, Sofia Coppola. And it's dust jacketed in what I think is possibly the most perfect pink ever. Right, let's have a look inside. So this sweet little book was given to me by my husband last year and it's all about the work of British artist Eric Revilius, whose work I became aware of in 2019 when I was on a trip to the Towner Gallery in Eastbourne with my illustration agent Jahan. I'd seen his work before that trip but I hadn't really delved deeper into it before then and I think about then my husband and I had spotted a card or a print in a shop and both really liked it. And then I started putting two and two together and my interest was piqued. Anyways, Mark bought me this book and I came to appreciate his work so much more. He was an artist who worked mainly in watercolour but also in woodblock. Um, there are some of his woodblocks. And he made lithographs too. He was also an official war artist in the Second World War but really very sadly lost his life at just 39 while on a trip to document the war. It's a real shame because the work he produced in such a short life, as I'm about to show you, it was so interesting and beautiful. So the book itself starts with lots of information about Rivilius's life, where he studied and who his influences were. I always like reading about that, not least because even if I feel like I forget it all, it's lodged in there somewhere amongst the random bits of art history that I know. It also talks about the more commercial aspects of his work, um, illustrating books and advertising and designing for homewares as well. It's quite a long section here at the front, but it is really interesting. And then we get to the more meaty art plates part of the book, which starts with his landscapes and interiors. So what I really like about Revilius's work is the sense of perspective in it. There's always such a sense of foreground and the distance, like the vision he had extended so much further than the immediacy of what he was painting or illustrating. A window or the landscape receding or a vast sky and it's always just done so delicately and with a beautiful lightness of hand. Look at this, it's just so soft and lovely. I just love the use of light in his work as well. It's again just done so delicately and the use of contrast and shadow really enhances that sense of depth and perspective. This one's just beautiful. These ladies, you can just almost feel yourself under that tree in that lovely kitchen garden. And I really like the sort of, in a lot of them there's kind of random object in the front foreground as well. This kind of brolly parasol that's just been left there, discarded on the hot day because they found the shade of the tree. There's so much movement in his work as well, not brought about by big gestural marks, but by the undulations in the hills and the delicately waving tree branches. Look at these. And some of them as well, I'll try and find an example. Here's some of those trees I was talking about. And some of them are just these clouds. You can almost feel them moving across the sky. And he's really captured the light so beautifully as well. You know exactly what kind of day this is. It's one of those days where it's kind of a little bit chilly. But when the sun comes out, it's lovely. But it's been raining, so there's kind of mud everywhere as well. <laughs> My daughter's least favourite type of day, incidentally, she told me recently. And I just love this greenhouse interior as well. I think this might be one of my favourites, actually. As someone who just loves geraniums and pelagoniums and has drawn them in the past, this really appeals. Again, with the perspective, it's just so good. 
the glass house is going into the background. And I just love how the focus is on these plants in the foreground and this random tipped over sack of soil or seed or whatever it might be and this coil of wire in the foreground. It's kind of like the imperfect mess is making it even more perfect. And this one too from the train interior looking towards this white chalk horse on the hills in the background. It's like that little glimpse you catch when the train hurtles past or, the, or in the car these days, I guess. But the chalk horses are endlessly fascinating anyway, aren't they? And I love how evocative this image is of seeing something from a moving vehicle. How if you aren't paying attention, you'll have missed it for good on that journey. And the old style train interior too. And also then there's this one, like from the other perspective. So this is somebody in the train looking up at the horse on their way to some somewhere maybe a city or the seaside and then there's this one the view looking down on that little train below in the valley on the plains or the levels it's just a great way of exploring a subject the horses on the hills the train but from two different completely different perspectives on that view these interiors are lovely as well i just love the way he captures light I think it's wonderful. So then we move on to this section, all about his wood engravings. And a lot of these were made as illustrations, so they have a different feel to them. I mean, obviously because they're in a different medium, but they are a bit more mystical and they have a lot more narrative in them. However, I think they still have that great play of light and, then, and the landscape ones seem to have that kind of same sense of perspective. Let me find some. Here we go. Just the receding into the background. The foreground elements are really prominent, but you just get that sense of depth. There's not so many of these wood blocks. I really like this one. The light coming through the trees. I like how on the shadowy side of the tree, the marks are more dense and then as the light comes through it kind of bleaches out a little bit. So then we come to his illustrations which it says here that they began as an idea to create a children's illustrated alphabet of 26 shops but eventually it was published as an adult book of prints in 1938 and they all have that delicate revelous touch to them again. And I really love them for what they depict, which is like a bygone age when each shop was a specialist at what they sold before our age of being able to get everything under one roof and the same thing in every town. It's, uh, yeah, it's such a shame on so many levels, really, isn't it? But I love the kind of graphic design touch these have got in the simplicity of the colour and the compositions. A submarine shop can you imagine I mean that would be kind of regatta outdoors wouldn't it but <laughs> you go and get these kind of diving bell suits these fancy ladies looking at buying a very elegant cake a wedding cake and then we come to the last section of the book. His life was so short, it's such a shame. Um, but this is the war art section. And as you can see from this one, there's still that amazing play of light and shadow, but it really has the reality of the ugly war, which he somehow manages to bring a kind of beauty to. I can imagine seeing like all of these vehicles of war taking over the landscape and big ships in the dark, and zeppelins and planes in the sky all were kind of like weird novelty for regular people a bit like queuing two meters apart to get into the supermarket during covid it meant like awful things were happening all around but also held a strange novel fascination and i kind of feel that sense of that when i look at these wartime landscapes of his especially these ones that i've just gone past kind of just this ordinary dock in a town, but look at these just flying around in the sky. And here in Cornwall, we have these kind of similar um, 
outposts left over from the war and some of the beachheads some of them have been converted but some of them have just been left and they're yeah they're quite evocative of a scary time so then there were these kind of um nitty gritty depictions as well of men at work during the war and the moments of boredom that must have come between all of the devastating action these guys playing cards just waiting for something to happen and then there's this one here right near the end where is it that he painted in situ apparently intending to finish it in the studio um but unfinished i feel like it's got this real haunting poignance to it like, did the men he was painting survive the war, or are there unfinished outlines of premonition of what befell them in fighting for their country? It's like an unfinished painting of perhaps unfinished lives. I find it really moving. And so, yeah, that's where this lovely book ends. Um, sadly, because of Raphilius's own unfinished life, but what a beautiful book of art it is. Just such a a masterclass in light and shadow and perspective and having a delicate hand in your work. Beautiful. So next up we have something very different but when it comes to delicateness of touch and colour I feel it fits right in with our previous book. And this is The Cotting Me Fairies by Anna Sender, which is based on a real life story that I absolutely loved when I was younger. And it's about two sisters who, utterly bored, painted really lifelike drawings of fairies that they then photographed at the bottom of their garden. And the photographs were seen by the famous writer Arthur Conan Doyle, who at the time was obsessed with spiritualism and the occult and believed that they were real. And the girls kept up the ruse and in a 19th century way, went viral. The people came from far and wide to see the fairies, but no, of course they never found any, and there was no evidence of them aside from the girls' photographs, and apparently they eventually confessed when they were really old ladies. So anyway, I love this telling of the story, that in the end the fairies are real to the girls, they were what made their imaginations dance and play in a way that a lot of adults forget to tap into as we age. It's like a reminder to check in with awe and wonder on a daily basis to never lose your sense of curiosity look at this guy just peeking around all these people looking i can't see any fairies those girls must be liars and then this guy's like hi so yeah i i just really love the illustrations that go along with this story from like the muted color palette it's all these kind of dusty pinks and reds and pale blues and she, like Revilius, has this real delicate touch of the way she draws things. I think it's beautiful. There's a real charm in that delicate use of pencil and the space she gives her drawings too. Just giving just enough detail that we can fill in the rest of the image ourselves. Again, subconsciously sparking our own imaginations. So this is her depiction of the photographs that the girls took. If you look online, you can actually see the real pictures that the girls took. Obviously not real fairies but they were the photographs that they managed to convince Arthur Conan Doyle of the, uh, of the existence of fairies with. And so I also really love the fairies that she's drawn. They aren't all sort of sweetness and cute, and some of them are kind of monstrous. I mean, look at this guy. But they play into the idea of the imagination that things aren't always as they seem what we've been told they should be like. I'll find some more pictures of them. Oh, here's, here we go. Let me hold that up. Showing off their bottoms and like sticking their tongues out of the camera. I absolutely love it. And yeah, that things aren't always as what we've been told they should be like. And that perhaps fairies are a little bit human or bug-like or part plant or a mix of the lot. And they're so cheeky. Look at them all. Kicking her in the face, pulling a ribbon. I really like how she's drawn them all. I also really like how she's drawn her landscapes. Okay, this one of the forest. You can tell it's like a dense forest. 
there are definite bits that we see but also so much that just blurs out where we fill in the gaps with what we think we can see probably because we aren't really properly looking or paying attention or our minds are elsewhere there's so much to love about this book for the story and the art inspiration it's a real treat of a book meant for children but actually more of a message to our adult selves it reminds me to be playful and unafraid to stand by what I believe in I really love this final spread another little bottom just poking out there (laughs) and the fairies and the playfulness gorgeous so that's the Cottingley Fairies by Anna Sender and lastly we have this gorgeous pink number which is an archive of the films and work of Sofia Coppola who made films such as Lost in Translation, The Virgin's Suicides and most recently last year in fact Priscilla So this book is really new to me. It's another that was bought for me by my husband, this time at Christmas last year. So I've only had it a month or so. And funnily enough, we've been talking about re-watching some films from our youth. And Sofia Coppola's film, The Virgin Suicides, was one of them. And we watched it again towards the end of last year. I'll find some pictures of it while I talk about it. There's Kirsten Dunst, dressed up, ready for school. Um, So yeah, re-watching... A film that you haven't seen for 20 odd years is a really strange experience. I still love the film, but what I took from it was completely different than what I saw in it when I was 18 or 19. And that's a whole different rabbit hole to go down sometime. But it made me realise how much I had and hadn't changed and that I'd grown up a lot. (laughs) More than I thought. So anyway, after re-watching that, Mark serendipitously... I can never say that word properly serendipitously saw this book for sale and got it for me for Christmas and also very serendipitously it perfectly matched the nail polish I was wearing on Christmas day so it all felt very full circle and meant to be and since then I've poured over it several times and also watched Coppola's version of Marie Antoinette so that is why I've chosen this book today so the book itself underneath this marvellous pink dust jacket has an equally marvellous fluorescent red cover with on the inside cover a photograph of what I presume is Coppola's studio which looks like a delightful creative mess the kind where someone needs snippets from lots of different things to pull together their vision and that is also what I love about this book it could just be about the films but it's also a collection of her photographs and other pictures and inspirations and letters and mood boards that inspire the look of her films I just have a really deep love of her aesthetic and the photographs of the sets really reveal to me what it is about them. I suppose most directors and filmmakers do this but she seems to really come at her films with a kind of DIY, scrapbook, intimate photographer's eye and there's so much more here than actually what makes the cut of the film itself. I love these bits where everyone's dressed up in their period costume but they're they using their modern gadgets at the same time such a clash of eras it's brilliant the book allows us a glimpse at all the little details and the photographs which looking at the acknowledgements were taken by a variety of people but mostly by herself and the photographs of the actors and the set are almost like she was photographing her closest friends there's a real seam of affection running through them all this is obviously all Marie Antoinette but even on her later films. It's just like um, photographs and being at a party or mates just kind of taking pictures of... Hang on, let me find some. Yeah, just mates on holiday, but it happens to be uh, Bill Murray. (laughs) And just on set. There's some inspirations. I just really like all the photographs of the sets as well. There was more from Marie, Marie Antoinette, actually, I seem to remember. I really like these scrapbooky bits of mixing up pictures from the film with where she gets her inspiration. So, yeah, there's all these details. The bling ring, I've not seen that. <clears throat> Here you go. 
there's so many details that just go into making a world come to life and particularly I really love these images of the opulent cakes and food from the set of the Marie Antoinette film such a feature of the actual film and they're kind of like works of art in themselves hang on let me find there was one in particular the colors here's more of the scrapbooky photograph kind of theme where are these pictures of the food they're going to have your mouth watering here we go I mean, Kirsten Dunst makes for a very beautiful backdrop of it too, but it's such an art form in itself. Stunning. And then there are all the details from Lost in Translation as well. Kind of makes me think of, um, there's a particular bit here, the Scarlett Johansson. Makes me think of um, a fashion shoot from kind of a late 90s ID magazine. All these kind of blurry but evocative shots. Where are they? Of the belongings of the girls in Lost in Translation as well. Must have been so much fun to pull these together and finding all the little trinkets and bits and pieces that would appeal to teenage girls at that time. Imagine scouring all the junkyard sales and flea markets. So much fun. So there's also letters and snippets of script dotted throughout the book as well. There's such a fascinating glimpse at the filmmaking process and I love the behind the scenes of anything creative that I don't know much about. I just find it really inspiring. So yeah, this is such a large book with so much to see. I'd love to be able to like flick through page by page and show it all to you but I think this video will be about 100 years long if I did that um yeah I've only actually seen a, couple, a few of her films um which came out in my late teens and early 20s and obviously the rewatch of The Virgin Suicides last year but I'd love to see more of them The Beguiled and Priscilla is next on my list um her newest film here we go I haven't shown you much of that actually have I all about Priscilla and Elvis and again, with the kind of really um, retro detailing and the beautiful photographs of the actors. And there she is herself. Look at that. You just don't get that kind of decor anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it just has that same aesthetic running through it, which I love about her films. Kind of soft blurring around the edges that kind of has this nostalgic, dreamlike quality that I really love so much. So if you're at all inspired by photography and film, world building and storytelling, then this is such a good book to get stuck into. It's a real taste of that kind of um, endeavour. And yeah, as I say, I'd love to show it all to you, but there is so much to it. You'll just have to get it and dig in. Here they are all together, um, seemingly very different in art and style, but there's a connection here, I think, in the lightness of touch that runs through all of the work I've shown you. And each is just a deeper look at the world around you through storytelling and all the work has that kind of delicate quality that allows us to fill in the gaps and deepening our immersion into each artist's world. I hope you enjoyed them and please, if you did, do give this video a thumbs up. It will help it get seen by more people and give my little channel a boost too. Let me know what you think of them in the comments. I look forward to hearing from you.